Hello and welcome to everyone joining us today for this special In Conversation. I'm Charlotte Audrey and I'm Director of the Centre for Progressive Policy. We are webcasting this session on our YouTube, Facebook and Twitter channels, so hello to everyone following us on there. If that's you, please tweet your questions and comments via at Centre Pro Policy using the hashtag, hashtag CPP Dambisamoyo or join our Facebook Live. Those on Zoom can ask questions here via the Q&A function and I'll do my best to feed those in in the second part of the event. Um, before we start, a reminder, this is our last event before the school summer holidays, but we look forward to seeing everyone in the autumn, particularly for our inclusive growth conference in October, which we'll be doing in hybrid format. Um, only last week, the Prime Minister set out his vision for levelling up, and many will see levelling up as a mere catchphrase that defines only the need for a solution to endemic inequalities. We know that COVID has made levelling up harder, but inclusive growth is therefore all the more important in creating shared prosperity. This has to be our long-term aim and it will hinge upon deep systemic change. Here to discuss what the most powerful businesses and corporations can do to contribute to that agenda is our guest for today's conversation. Dr. Danby Samoyo is an author, economist and key influencer when it comes to strategic investment and public policy. She's been outspoken about many issues that touch on systemic change, including how to fix economic growth. A famous TED talk of hers and an issue, an issue at the heart of our work here at Centre for Progressive Policy. She also works closely with several boards and um, the role of boards and decision making in biz, big business is one of the topics she's going to talk about us uh, with us today. To note, she was a commissioner on the Commission of, on Race and Ethnic Disparities, which published in March this year. And she's also a non-exec director at the Department for Trade. So I shall hand over to Dr Moyo. Here we go. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, be here. And um, I really appreciate the opportunity to engage on very important issues. But what I think would be um, really important is to sort of baseline the, the sort of uh, foundational facts with respect to where the global economy is, um, and perhaps maybe take it a step behind that and talk about where the global economy was before COVID hit in earnest in 2020. Um, and I just want to explain very clearly that um, be, even before um, COVID hit in 2020, there were already great concerns about economic growth and the ability for government to deliver on many social programs. In particular, as policymakers and economists like myself, we were already worried and talking about low growth. Uh, economic growth I know is a, is a whole other subject that we probably have to have a debate on, on the efficacy of growth and um, where and how it can be better. But fundamentally, the ability to transform people's lives and living standards, which is essentially driven by economic growth, was already stalling. In order to double per capita incomes in one generation, an economy needs to be growing by 3% per year. Before COVID hit, many economies developed and developing economies were already experiencing growth below that number. In the UK, for example, economic growth was around 1.2 to 1.4%. Germany in Q4 of 2019 posted 0% growth, no growth whatsoever in Q4 of 2019. In addition to that, large emerging economies, these are economies that have at least 50 million people like Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Russia, were already struggling with low growth as well. Many of them coming out of a recession post the financial crisis and really hovering around 1.2%. So this has meaningful implications for our ability to reduce poverty and to continue to enhance living standards around the world. So that's point number one. Point number two is again, even before COVID hit, we were struggling with public policy impotence, both in terms of monetary policy, such as interest rates, as well as fiscal policy, which is public spending, taxes, and the amount of debt that government was carrying. With respect to monetary policy, interest rates, we know after the financial crisis of 2008, we were in a world of historically low interest rates. Even today, we know that many regions across Europe, Japan, they have negative interest rates, which is essentially for people who are not economists, we're being asked to, be, to pay for banks to hold our money. That's negative interest rates. Why does that matter? Because for things like pension funds 
are, are estimated or calculated based on the discounted future cash flows. And having a very, very small or even negative interest rates means that these liabilities balloon to a place where not just government, but corporations that and companies that have promised uh, pension funds start to struggle to be able to pay those pension funds. And we've seen that happen time and time again um, in history. But as I said, it was not just interest rates and monetary policy that's become quite challenged quantitative easing, et cetera, but also fiscal policy. Before COVID hit in earnest, you had the Congressional Budget Office in the United States, for example, in 2016, saying that the US government would struggle to pay for entitlement programs like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, um, many social programs uh, that are very similar to the social infrastructure in the UK, because they had, had too much debt on the back of the financial crisis. We know that in terms of debt, whether it's household debt, government debt, corporate debt, student loans, auto loans, credit cards, the world is now at a very, very high level, especially um, with the response that governments, in terms of governments having to step in um, to help support a recovery and certainly support and combat um, COVID in 2020 onwards. This is incredibly important. And there's a wonderful book called This Time It's Different. I urge you to read this. It is written by two economists, um, Carmen Reinhardt and um, Kenneth Rogoff. They looked at 900 years of debt of governments, 900 years. And they showed that consistently when government debt gets over 60% debt to GDP ratio, you start to see a slowdown on economic growth which has a meaningful impact on whether or not government can fund important public good programs such as education, healthcare, infrastructure, national security, et cetera, which I'm sure we will detail and get into some more. So that really is a, a grave issue of concern. The debt to GDP ratio now um, in the UK, in the US is over 100%. And more than that, the global economy has debt to GDP of around 320% which in many concerns means that many countries may not be able to pay it back, back. And this issue of debt is moving away from just being an economic question, because I'm sure some of you will be thinking, well, who cares? Government can exist in perpetuity, doesn't matter. But the problem is that we are now owing a lot of this money to countries like China. So the conversation is moving away from just being an economic issue into being a geopolitical issue. Um, for example, China is the largest lender to the United States government, foreign lender to the US government. That means that the US has to, in many respects, um, fall in line to, uh, to its lender, as you know, um, through whether credit cards or any other obligations that we might have. The third issue that we were dealing with before COVID, again, was a confluence of economic headwinds. Um, and I wrote about these extensively in my book, Edge of Chaos in 2018. What am I talking about? I'm talking about technology and the risk of a jobless underclass. This is a very real problem. Estimates are that we'll have a loss of jobs of about 85 million due to digitization and automation, particularly for women and unskilled workers. We were also worried about demographic shifts. Both the quality and the quantity of the world's population has been changing materially. India is adding 1 million people a month to its population, a million people a month. Try and think for a moment what that might mean in terms of delivering public policy goods and also opportunity for society more generally. The world's population today is about 8 billion people and will continue to grow at a very rapid clip in a way it's never done in history or prehistory until 2100 when there will be 11 billion people on the planet. This has enormous consequences for immigration, economic growth, um, what, how government functions, what government does, and what government is actually able to do, but also how and why the role of corporations itself is changing. And I know we'll come back to that. But there were other issues, inequality. Um, I spoke in Davos at the World Economic Forum a, a number of years ago. That year, Oxfam had put out a report showing that the eight wealthiest men, and they were all men, had more wealth than the bottom 50% of the world's population. About, at that time, it was about 3.5 billion people. Obviously, coming into COVID, we've re revealed even greater inequalities in education, access to healthcare, uh, access to opportunity. So we were really already worried about this before COVID hit. 
In addition, issues of climate change, uh, issues of, uh, of productivity declines, these have been structural factors that already before COVID hit, we were telegraphing was going to set the world into a low economic growth environment with all the negative consequences, civil wars, risks of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, disorderly immigration, uh, worries about uh, populism, et cetera, that have subsequently come to be true. So where are we today? Well, we've had a pandemic, a global pandemic that is still going on. Not only have we failed to coordinate among the world, but we failed to coordinate even among developed advanced economies. And at this moment, we're continuing to contend with issues of different variants, with issues of struggling uh, ability to deliver uh, 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 vaccines globally. Um, and, and this is notwithstanding the structural problems that I outlined for you on growth, impotence of public policy, concerns about the confluence of factors that continue to uh, pervade and, and underpin the economy. So yes, today we're looking at uh, stock markets that have um, outperformed over their about 15% returns for this year. Uh, we are looking at, uh, at a, a much more constructive story. We seem to be coming back to work and back to the office, notwithstanding the, the fact that we're getting pinged on our apps. Um, but the reality is we still have not solved a lot of the structural problems that I, I mentioned, things like climate change, et cetera. Um, but what would I like you to, to leave you with? I'd like to, to, to basically provide a little bit of perspective on what exactly is going on in the boardrooms um, of, of large global corporations. I myself have served on the boards of large global and complex corporations for the past 10 years. It is really important that people understand that corporations have an important role to play um, globally and with respect to society. With respect to specific numbers in the United States alone, um, corporate, global corporations provide 30 million jobs. They, their revenues are two thirds of US GDP. US GDP is over 20 trillion. Two thirds of their revenue is that. Um, when you start to think about job creation, uh, issues of tax base for government, um, issues of um, innovation, as we've seen, how corporations from AstraZeneca, Pfizer, um, and, uh, and Moderna, which is a relatively new company, were able to rally and deliver a vaccine. We have to understand that that is working in partnership, government, as well as pharmaceutical companies and other organizations. And so we cannot be in a world where we're just condemning the private sector. What we need to do is make sure that we enhance the relationship, which has worked very well over time, whether it's through the Manhattan Project, DARPA, um, issues of the development of Silicon Valley, the partnership between government and private sector must be at its highest level. Let me conclude and pass it back to Charlotte in a minute by saying the following. We are clearly in a different world from the world that Milton Friedman was talking about in the 1970s, this notion of uh, the business of business is business. Um, it's, it, it is not uh, any more acceptable. It's no, no longer even um, uh, sort of uh, thought to be uh, a, a mantra which businesses follow. We understand our responsibility to be a good participating citizen in society. However, let us understand that board members and corporations are not elected by the broad base of society. Things like in the ESG, so environmental, social, and governance agenda, things like climate change, racial and gender uh, diversity, worker advocacy, uh, data privacy, obesity, gun control. We need leadership from government. That is not and should not be a situation where we expect corporations to be taking the the lead um, without the help and support of governance, um, because ultimately we are there um, traditionally and uh, in terms of the, the law, we have been um, a, company, a company law, we have been uh, given a mandate as board members to provide um, support in terms of the strategy, succession planning of these companies. Um, and we are now being asked to do more, and that's fine, we're doing more. Um, we're looking at metrics on issues of climate change and race, et cetera. But at the same time, we cannot achieve long-term success without the support of government, government. But more than that, we have to be sensible and understand that all of these challenges um, are not easy to solve and require the best minds to be much more constructive than deconstructive and to take a view when respond, responding to climate change or any of the issues I've, I've uh, outlined to understand the complexity and the contours of these issues. Um, and I'll give you two really quick examples and then I'll send it back to Charlotte. 
Number one, let's take racial discrimination. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that we cannot tolerate it and we should not tolerate it. And indeed, we know that from corporations, even in the interest of corporations, having a more diverse basis for, for boards, for CEOs and uh, the C-suite, as well as the work base is absolutely critical, not only to survive, but to thrive and compete in the 21st century. No doubt about it. The data is clear. Look at the reports from McKinsey, from Harvard, from many other organizations that have looked and they have shown that consistently in terms of return on equity, return on invested capital, companies that are more diverse do better. Absolutely. However, we should not at all be creating a narrative that suggests that we should fight discrimination with discrimination. We cannot be in a world where we start to segregate other groups, major, traditional majority groups, and indeed we don't want to lose high performing white males just because they happen to be white males. That is self-defeating and long term I argue, would argue would actually undermine the purpose of trying to seek a more diverse and inclusive society. Let me give you another quick example, climate change. There's not a single boardroom in which I have served over the past 10 years that does not take climate change seriously. We absolutely understand that the risks of climate change are not only huge, they're also imminent. They are large and they are here. They are urgent and they are important. However, in solving for climate change, we have to remember that there are 1.5 billion people around the world, many of them that look like me and are from my home continent of Africa, who do not have access to energy in a consistent and sustainable way. What does that mean for the corporations and the organizations that are looking to improve people's livelihoods? It means that claims and arguments to defund fossil fuel companies are short term. They're a bit hasty. We need to have those, those, those voices around the table to talk about what we can do in a efficient and in a sensible way so that we can continue to move into a more green and clean world, but without losing more people to the poverty and the, the condemning them to poverty and a life that is really unbearable because we have taken a very quick and uh, an unconsidered stance. In terms of what that means for corporations and for government, it means that we have to look at the risks, of course, we have to mitigate for things like greenhouse gases, CO2 emissions, water intensity, absolutely. Those are critically important, but we must also think about investing in the future, thinking about where to put that additional dollar or pound to work so that we can continue to solve for energy and solve for living standards of people all around the world, not just for our neighbors around the corner. What does that look like? It means investing in solar, in wind, in geothermal, in battery, in nuclear gen four. It means investing in new innovations and technologies, but having the temerity and good sense to understand that these issues are complicated and they require sensible responses and sensible and thoughtful engagement from people from all walks of life and not just heretics and, and the sense that uh, this discussion should be done uh, very quickly without, considered, without a considered approach. So I'm here to assure you that this, the world is not coming to an end. Um, the world has suffered through and been challenged in many other environments. But that being said, we are in an incredibly difficult time where growth is challenged, where government efficacy is questionable in some places, where we are facing challenges from companies and organizations um, in, that are, are living in, in ideological um, settings or in countries that have very different views and values from our own. Um, and yet we are all on the same planet. And as we deal with these issues, it's really important for us to take a sensible approach, um, one that is innovative, one that is sustainable, and one that is flexible so that we can incorporate the views and values of everybody from around the world. Um, Charlotte, I'm gonna pass it back to you and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, what a fantastic way to kick off uh, what I know will be a lively discussion. Um, lots of themes there to choose from. I think the first one I want to come to is the this idea of public policy impotence. And um, we've seen the um, extent to which President Joe Biden, for example, is really pushing a, a, a strong interventionist, interventionist agenda. Only this morning we saw William Hague, um, former lead, Conservative leader, um, calling on Boris to be more interventionist. And that's not traditionally associated with um, a Conservative government. Do you, ref do you think those, the pushes to be more interventionist reflect the degree of 
public policy failure that you outlined earlier, do you think it reflects perhaps instead a shift in the legitimacy of the role of the state? And I'm interested in your thoughts on how that translates to economic outcomes. Or do you think it's something else? How do we get back that public policy efficacy? Is it about the state doing more or is it about the state doing different or again, something else? So um, I'm over 50 years old. And uh, the reason I say that is that when you're on the planet, as long as I've been, you'll realize a lot of these conversations have happened time and time and time and time again. There's nothing new. There's nothing really exciting about the, the relative discussion on whether or not government should be involved and how much government should be involved. We've had this conversation since Adam Smith, um, 1600s, 1500s, go back in history. This is not a sort of groundbreaking conversation in that sense. And I don't mean it in a disparaging way to you. Charlotte is just for people in the audience to understand that we've been grappling with this issue in time in memoriam. Um, I would argue that one of the ways to think about how to uh, what government role is to, is to think about the trade off or the, the difference between tactical interventions and structural. I think most people, and doesn't matter what your political leanings are, by and large, in an emergency, a global pandemic, a financial crisis, um, a war, there is a sense that government has to step up and do more. I don't really think that anybody is quibbling, maybe at the margin. Some people say we're doing too much, we're not doing enough, but fundamentally, everybody believes that at certain times, tactics are required. And that's the world we're in right now. We're in a pandemic. I mean, people have been sitting at home for 18 months. There are real challenges that we probably don't even yet have yet um, appreciated, not just in health, but in education, the long sort of long COVID is not just about health. It's about those knock on effects that we have not even yet started to think about. We know about the, the uh, uh, um, uh, violence towards women. We know about structural changes that are occurring right as we are living here, moving us more to a digital economy that could really impact unskilled workers. So to me, you know, I don't think there's much to be said, except yes, we're in it. We're in a crisis. We expect government to do more. Um, the question that you're really posing is what is the role of government in a more structural um, environment? Longer term, what should government be doing? And this, again, is an age old debate because people who have a lot of faith in humanity and think that many more of us are able to, to have, if we have opportunity to contribute to society would argue we need less government. People who take the view, you know what, there are in, you know inherent uh, weaknesses in society, cultural, social weaknesses, but also um, um, uh, economic challenges and geopolitical challenges that have created a disadvantaged community. And they think that a lot more people fall in that camp would argue that we need more government to protect those people, to provide a welfare state. This again is, if you think about a normal distribution, the means have moved um, on both of these points um, in a structural debate. What do I think? I think very simply that if we have a government, um, and this is uh, something that uh, Michael Bloomberg has talked about, and I, I think it's very compelling. If we have governments that are data-driven, that are um, forward-leaning, that use measured outcomes and are not corrupt, we'll be fine. That's all we need from government are those four things, data-driven, forward-leaning, so looking to the future, looking at the issues that are coming, not just where we are today, measured outcomes, looking at metrics, objective metrics, what are we actually managing policy towards? And finally, not being corrupt. If we have governments performing at that level, I honestly, then I'm really sorry, because that's my dog going nuts, but he'll be quietened in a minute. But if we have a government that perform at that level, believe me, we're going to be fine. The problem we have that not just in public policy, but also in the private sector and in society writ large, we have become very short termists. We want solutions today, and we don't care about the consequences and the costs of the future. And this, this cycle of short-termism, which by the way, we are the ones who reward public policymakers for short-termism. In the United States, they have elections every two years. Every two years, they have an election. Um, and that, when we talk about the political system being decoupled from the economic challenge, which are structural, education, infrastructure, healthcare. These are things that require long-term investments. It takes 20 years before we reap the benefit. It's cre we've created a schism between the long-term economic challenges the world faces versus the short-term aspects and the incentives of public policymakers. We have created that gap 
And it's so damaging that we aren't solving for a lot of the long-term problems that we know are coming. This is not some big surprise. So I worry that the government where we are, the governments generally are not thinking about the future response. They get very sucked in into the here and now, and that has dire consequences. So just coming back to the business aspect and particularly Michael Bloomberg's four points, I mean, one of the things that's noticeable by its absence there is that it is about how government might incentivize or uh, regulate business market activity, for example. I, do you have more faith that business and investors will think in a more long termist way? And maybe we've, they've started to show that in their response to managing climate change in a way that actually government hasn't been able to do. And therefore, whether it's, say, for example, the lead that the automotive industry has made on electric vehicles, that actually will be pushing government further and faster rather than the other way around. So I was very clear a moment ago. I said that the short-termism was not just in government. It was in corporations as well as in society writ large. We all want stuff today. Um, we love Amazon. But why? Because I can click a button and because of Prime, the product uh, appears with me in a few hours. So let's not just spin this on one group versus another. Society writ large has become much more short-term. Um, I can tell you what we are doing in the corporate boardrooms to try and uh, affect and make changes around um, short-termism. We're making specific changes, um, for example, around compensation. We now do not just pay people based on a salary or bonus at the end of the year. We are actually compensating people thinking much longer term. And I talked in my book, Edge of Chaos in 2018, about how much some of that thinking I think would be very, very valuable in the public sector, where I'm also doing some work. I gave the specific example of Singapore. In Singapore, not only are ministers um, paid and compensated based on their output. So for example, if you're the minister of health, your compensation is based or is reflected, um, reflects how well uh, living standards have improved or life expectancy has improved or issues around uh, infant mortality. But crucially, and this is why I think this is where the private sector is ahead of the public sector, if in years to come, 10, 15 years after you've retired and you're on sitting on a lovely beach somewhere, we find out that actually you were fudging the numbers or actually the things that you were doing were actually not in the long-term interest of the country. We have things called malice and clawback. We can actually get the money back from you. And I do think that these are innovations we should be thinking about. Again, not just in the private sector, but also in the public sector. Our policymakers should be thinking about these long-term problems if we hope to solve them. It's not just a matter of throwing money at these problems without due consideration for the long-term consequences. And it doesn't matter if it's climate change or inequality or issues around the discrimination. All of these are very corrosive for society. And so we need to be much more vigilant in thinking about embedding these types of things into the long term. We're doing it already um, in the boards that I serve on. Up to 30 percent of compensation is not just about, hey, how, much, how are your financial return? Up to 30 percent is how much have you done with respect to climate change? We want to see real metrics on that. How much have you done with respect to a more diverse environment? How much have you done to drive innovation? This is not theory. We are doing this practically. Um, and if you read annual reports, take the time to read the annual reports of the corporations, you'll find that many companies are doing that now precisely to address these long-term considerations. And there is a model, at least in Singapore, that shows that we can do this in public sector as well. Thanks so much. Well, I think that's a good opportunity to bring in um, our first uh, live question from the audience. We've got Ellie Peatman here, who's from the Good Business Charter. Over to you, Ellie. Hi, uh, nice to meet you, Dan Visa, and thank you, Charlotte. Um, so my organisation accredits organisations based on good business behaviour. Um, we recently did some polling, which shows that 97% of consumers believe that being a responsible business is important. Uh, many of them saying that they would switch brand if they knew that business was behaving irresponsibly. This might not be new news, but... Uh, my I would do it too. Is, I'd switch too, so... <laughs> yeah. Of course, things like fair trade exist, you know, for a reason people prefer those naturally. But my question is, how do you think we can ensure businesses are taking the, uh, this seriously and that the general public can know who is acting in a responsible way? 
So again, please read the reports, the annual reports. Um, you know, we are doing a lot of innovative work in this space. I, I should have said, actually, for the past 10 years, I've served on a, a numerous number of boards in, um, in the UK, in the US, Canada, continental Europe. Um, I've also been on boards in different sectors energy, mining, banking, consumer goods, um, you know, technology. Um, I've been through many different challenged environments. I had a, a chairman die in office. Um, we've had to restructure businesses. We've had penalties from regulators. So I have a, a good understanding of what is going on in the boardroom. And I can tell you your question, Ellie, is really important because what you're asking is an existential crisis for companies. If we do a bad job with our customers, engaging with regulators and government, looking or showing that we can be good citizens, we're gonna go out of business. There's no doubt about it. So what are we doing? We're not only following um, things like Edelman Trust Index and your types of uh, good business types of charter, we are also looking at new ways of evaluating how we're performing. We look at employee surveys, not just the ones that we uh, administer within companies. We also go to platforms such as Glassdoor, The Layoff, Blind. These are new innovative platforms that give current employees, future employees, um, and uh, and uh, you know uh, for, former employees the opportunity to to provide feedback on uh, how we're performing. Provenance matters. It's clear to us. You know, we we are now living in an era where it won't be too long before we'll be able to go into a McDonald's and use our mobile phones to sweep on a, a hamburger menu, and it will tell us this is how much CO2 was emitted, this is how much water was used, this is what the average wage was um, to produce this hamburger. And we as consumers will be able to quickly make decisions about whether or not we want to pay for those products. So we are doing a lot in this space. We need a lot more help. But to me, again, we, we're looking, we're always looking for people to be constructive and not destructive. And so highlighting our, our inequities and the ine inefficiencies, fantastic, please do it all day long. However, don't just come to us with problems. Let's come to, together with real solutions so we can continue to move the world in a, in, a, in a positive way in all of these very challenged environments that we're going to deal with. Thanks, Dambisa. And I think that the main reflection that I've got there is the thinking about how in coming together, um, we can then drive real system change. Otherwise, it, it, there's a risk that it becomes the isolated examples of your Unilevers exactly. or whoever in the space. Exactly. So, and I think that is a role for government and that partnership approach that you were taking. Um, I want to um, move now to Will Sullivan um, from the TUC. And then I've got a question from Will Mapplebeck in uh, the Q&A that I'm going to come to. But first, Will. Hi, thanks. And thanks for your talk. Um, I was particularly um, uh, interested in what you had to say about short termism. Uh, both in terms of government and corporations. And wondered what you thought about whether there was a need for a sort of wider discussion about the purpose of corporations around getting away from, issue, you know, uh, the sort of imperative of shareholder primacy um, uh, uh, in terms of, you know, the dynamic, the dynamic around some of that short termism, both in terms of sort of investments and you know how how, how corporations uh, uh, um, work in relation in relation to governments as well so you know about that need for almost like redefining uh, more socially what the purpose of business is um so i have uh, three things to say on, on this uh, and thank you for that that good question um so first of all um since really explicit um, uh, statements from the Business Roundtable 2019, they were very explicit that we have moved from a world of uh, financial primacy, financial shareholder primacy, into a world of stakeholder capitalism. We, we, I honestly don't know anybody in the corporate boardroom who doesn't get that. We get it. We understand. And we're moving swiftly into that world. And I said earlier that this is, um, I don't think is up much up for debate that the world has moved from the sort of view that the business of business is business. We, we, don't, we don't talk about those type of things anymore. We understand our, our broader responsibility. Um, I did mention earlier also that that is not without its challenges. We want to make sure that people understand we are not elected. Corporations are not elected entities. So I would just say, you know, today we might all be enthusiastic about how corporations and companies should be doing all this stuff. 
but it might not be too long before people start to say, well, wait a second, why is Unilever taking the lead on education or, you know, take your pick company, taking a, a you know, a lead in, in, uh, in, in social aspects. Um, they are not elected by us. We didn't ask them to, to represent our views. So it is a, a very, very delicate point that we need to think about. But I will assure you that um, notwithstanding legal statements in the Delaware Corporation, uh, in the UK, in the company standards, um, which say that we should be prioritizing the, uh, the financial shareholder, the world has moved on, corporations have moved on, companies have moved on. We don't guide for only that. We take into consideration all stakeholders. And it is a very difficult balancing act. I gave you two examples a moment ago about why these trade-offs are, are quite challenging. The second point I want to just emphasize here is please do not give government a free pass. Um, we need government to, to be part of this these solution. Um, it shouldn't be an either or, but we absolutely need to make sure that government is part and parcel of these discussions and is taking the lead in a lot of the issues um, that we've outlined here. And I worry a lot that um, society has become frustrated with government and political gridlock, and we all understand that, that situation, um, and therefore are looking for somebody else to solve many of these problems. Um, and for the reasons I've just outlined a moment ago, corporations can go so far, but not further, because we have our own constraints um, with respect to uh, our own uh, mandate and also the levers that we have to effect change, which traditionally have been around compensation and hiring and firing the CEO. Um, I'm optimistic that we can do more if we have more public-private partnerships, much more government uh, with those, those um, aspects that I, I mentioned earlier. But I do think it, we shouldn't be take the view that government should get a free pass on this. And then the third point is really something that we've talked about already, which is about how can we continue to embed the need for long-term thinking uh, on these issues. And the more we can do that, in a constructive way and think about those targeted metrics and think about the importance of society more generally, I think the better off will be. So things like short-term consumption, uh, 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 compensation, issues of, uh, of bonus pay, et cetera, are all on the table um, because these things can be used as levers, I believe, to effect change longer term. So I, I do remain optimistic, but I think that we shouldn't put too much weight or all the weight, I should say, um, on, uh, on on corporations and companies. And really, we do need to push for government as well. Thank you. Thank you, Well, Thank you, um, Dr. Moyer. One of the constraints that we've just seen is around the role of competition authorities and um, the technology monopolies and platforms that you alluded to earlier um, find themselves constrained and or at, at the kind of frontier of the, the, the legitimacy of the role of firms globally. I want to come back to something else that you mentioned, which was around the geopolitics and how firms play into that. And, and a question from um, Will Mapplebeck from Core Cities um, was, um, he was struck by your thoughts on China and its fiscal relationship with the US. What's the future for mature democracies who find themselves financially outgunned by countries with less enlightened regimes when it comes to issues like LGBT rights or racism? And how do they continue to put progressive case forward? Well, look, you know, first of all, China was the largest economy in the world in 1820. Okay, 1820, it was the largest economy in the world. And um, that country made um, a number of policy errors that cost it hundreds of years of economic growth. Um, why am I telling you that? Because today China is the second largest economy after the United States. Um, we happen to be living in a world uh, which I find incredibly uh, interesting as a, as a scientist and somebody who's interested in public policy. Um, we are living in a world where the number one economy, just in terms of GDP, is a democratic society that believes in market capitalism. And that country is being uh, uh, is being hot on its heels. Our, uh, so the second economy, China, which is a country that has deprioritized um, uh, uh, political competition, deprioritized democracy, and has focused on state capitalism. Um, and we are living in this world right now, and we have many countries that are asking this very question, what should we be doing? Which one should we pick? Which one is better? These two countries that have completely different political systems, completely different economic systems, actually have the same Gini coefficient, um, which is the measure of inequality. So if you care about inequality, you know, one model doesn't really outgun the other. Um, and yes, there, there, are, there should be a much more lively debate about the interplay between Western society and China. 
China is not just domineering, uh, dominating, excuse me, in terms of um, lending to the United States, as I talked about earlier, it is also the largest lender today, largest lender to the emerging markets. It's bigger than the IMF, the World Bank, and the Paris Club. It is the biggest trading partner, the biggest foreign lender, and the biggest investor to more countries around the world, uh, many more countries around the world, developed and developing. So yes, do we care or, or, you know, about their own um, political and cultural imprimatur? Of course, um, those are real questions about how it, the world is going to operate. We're already in danger as it stands of there being a splinter net um, in the next 10 years, a world in which we'll have a Chinese based platform of technology, which will compete to the Western type model of, of uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of technology. Uh, this is not theory, this is happening. Uh, China is ahead of us in many aspects of technology, face recognition, aspects of AI. Um, and we. this is where um, the concerns that the question uh, question posed are real, um, embedded in, uh, in, the, in these different systems, in the Chinese system in particular, are their own cultural norms. Um, and their own views about not just uh, LGBTQ, but also about uh, race, about women. Um, and so, you know, for me, one of my greatest concerns, and I've said this multiple times already today, is that we are living in, in the West and we're being incredibly deconstructive in our societies at exactly the time when we should be more constructive about how we should become much stronger together. Um, and these types of openings create a, a, a world, whether it's cancel culture, whether it's shouting at each other, it's, it's divisive politics, you know, from whether it's society, social media are creating these platforms and opportunities for competition from other countries to come in with different ideological beliefs. So yes, are we under challenge? Are we looking at the, what, the, what this means as a practical matter? Absolutely. And it's, it's not just on cultural and social issues. It's also on how we live and work. In the West, we love work-life balance. In China, many companies are doing 996. So their employees are happy or are, are working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. You know, can we compete with that? Is that something that we want our society to live with? Um, we have to make these decisions every day at the corporate level, but also in the government level, as we're trying to decide whether or not to have diplomatic ties, security ties, uh, economic ties with, with many societies that have different views. So this is a live question, but I do believe that the, uh, in the argument of physician heal thyself, um, our own societies are eating ourselves alive. Um, we don't even need to wait for China to come up with their own ideological beliefs. We ourselves are failing to come together um, and have constructive conversations. We are the ones who are killing ourselves. Um, and so this is where I think there's a lot more scope for engagement and opportunity to work together. Thank you, Dambisa. Question, do you think that protectionism and the increase of protectionism is an example of how we're killing ourselves? Do you think backing away from globalization is a risk or an opportunity for inclusive growth? Let me um, take a moment just to explain what, what you, I think you mean by globalization, just to, to, to maybe level set for everybody on what I think it is. So to me, there are five aspects of it, and I'll just go th through them really quickly. Trade in goods and services, movement of capital, investment capital across borders for we, so we can actually invest in things in different countries, um, movement of people, immigration, the ability for people to move from one place to another. Um, I talked about a moment, uh, the splinter net, that's an example of global standards. The idea that we have a society that says, hey, actually, this is how we're going to behave with respect to cyber or to trading regimes, et cetera, global standards. Um, and then finally, global cooperation. In all of these five aspects of globalization, we've actually seen a material breakdown. Um, in trade before COVID hit, we already were seeing a flat line of trade. Um, the numbers were around 3% growth had actually flatlined and since some instances started to decline. We've also seen across the board, much more fractured society, much more balkanized. We've had Brexit, we've had TPP. We're not having global regimes um, a la 1944 with Bretton Woods, with the World Bank and IMF. These institutions are also coming under fire um, as they are, are competing with the rise of Chinese um, uh, um, institutions, the RCEP, uh, Belt and Road Initiatives, et cetera. So the world is fracturing, absolutely. Um, and and in, in some respects, 
Um, you, we could, you know, it's clear that the data shows that we've only had liberal democracy and market capitalism for one percent of human time. One percent. So we're living in a in an anomaly in many respects. And don't forget, only thirty percent of the world lives in liberal democracies. The majority of the world is living in authoritarian states or illiberal democracies. So what does that mean in terms of, you know, how should we be thinking about globalization? I'm afraid that it seems to me that this is one of the big headwinds. Um, the, I strongly believe in a global society. I, it is clear to me that the world benefits from globalization. However, we have delivered it in a way that has got real questions. Um, and you know, this is probably not the time to go into great details on the and the actual balance sheet of of wins and losses. But clearly, there have been enormous pockets of society that have lost in the globalization environment over the last thirty years. And I do worry that we are moving back into a period um, of the the period between nineteen thirty and nineteen fifty four, which was post a global environment, much like what we've come through. Very global, lots of trade big corporations, you know, society much more inter interrelated on all of those areas of trade, capital, movement of people, et cetera. Between 1930 and 1954, society reversed. And this is the risk that I think we're facing right now. It became much more deglobalized. We stopped trading. We had smoot Hawley in the United States, which imposed numerous thousands and thousands of tariffs and quotas on goods and services. We had immigration fall. In the United States uh, today, about 13% of Americans are foreign born. During that period of 1930 to 1954, we actually had very anti-immigration policies and the proportion of foreign born Americans dropped to around 6%. So I'm worried. Yes, I'm worried about deglobalization. Why? Because that period of 1930 to 1954 is characterized by low economic growth, high unemployment, and we did need much more government progressive policies because the economies were going down. Um, and more than that, and just for those of you who, who like to geek out on stock market numbers, in 1929, at just before the, um, the, the, the stock market crash, 1929, the Dow Jones Industrial Stock Market, which is like the FTSE um, stock market index, peaked at 381 points. The next time that it hit 381 points was 1954, 25 years later. So you have a whole period of economic malaise. And I worry right now that we're in a world of a downdraft in terms of globalization. We can't even get Western developed economies to agree on things like a vaccine. Um, we can't even agree on that. And so the notion that we're going to somehow succeed in solving for global public goods like climate change, if we can't even agree among a handful of developed economies around COVID and just dealing with vaccinations, I mean, there's a lot to be despondent about. And really, this is where we need much more action, uh, much more engagement um, from, from not just the business sector who have incentives and interests in, in from seeing a global world, but also from society writ large. Let's not stop, stop, let's stop tearing stuff down and let's start engaging together to solve for some of these big weaknesses. Before we um, try and end on a more um, sunny note, um, I just want to be despondent for slightly longer and reflect on that period, 1930s to 1954. I mean, we saw the birth of Keynesian economic economics during that time and if we're thinking now the role of fiscal policy which you referred to previously and you know imagine we're advising the chancellor on the options he has particularly given our debt to gdp ratio as you mentioned previously and a conservative party that does not want to go back to austerity part two which it pursued after the financial crisis in 08 how do we start to kind of get ourselves out of the current bind um, and, and, and really drive public investment into tackling those entrenched inequalities and supporting the kind of coordinated outcomes that you've spoken about, whether that's on climate change or anything else. Well, I'm afraid my answer is going to be wholly dissatisfying to you, Charlotte, um, because, you know, ultimately, um, it seems to me that the, the biggest problem we have is, as I mentioned earlier, is the schism between all these long-term problems, climate change, et cetera, and the short-termism embedded in political cycles, as well as business. But you know, I feel more confident than business where we're making big strides here. 
Um, in my book in, in 2018, Edge of Chaos, I did outline 10 proposals to try and directly attack this problem. I can't obviously go through all of them here, but there are things that we can do to try and, to my mind, lengthen um, some of the policy um, decisions and discussions so that we don't end up in a cycle of, you know, really uh, you know, bad policies or policies that work in the short term, but really come at an enormous cost in the future. Um, I, you know, I, I do think it, we've been, we are right now hand, working through a very difficult period, obviously, with um, the pandemic and not really recognizing what those consequences are. But I, I worry a lot that we don't take a more um, general uh, or a broader view to these problems. So as I mentioned earlier, COVID is not just a health problem. We need to be at the table with economists, with anthropologists, sociologists, people from different fields so that we can come up with a constructive way forward. As we deal with things like climate change or, or discrimination and thinking about what society should look like in the future, we do need to come up with better metrics. We shouldn't just be sitting here thinking, let's solve it in the here and now. Let's think about where the world is going. So yes, there are many companies that say, oh, we've got a lot of diversity in our groups because they are retail companies. And they're, 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 but what they neglect to tell us is that a lot of the people that they're pointing to as diverse workers are low skilled workers with no skills, many, many times women, minorities that look like me. And the risk is that those are the very people who are going to lose their jobs um, if digitization and automation takes hold. So how should we be thinking about that? Let's not just think about the short term, let's also think about the long term. And that requires sensible discussions, not yelling at each other and you know, ad hominem attacks, which is essentially where the world is today, unfortunately. So um, just turning to one of my questions in, from Tom Ockenden on the Q&A, um, building on that diversity point. Um, he asked what the best steps are for businesses to take and government in supporting them to ensure that, that we're not waiting around years, if not decades, for greater diversity and diversity of thought. Yes, and diversity of process. Diversity of, of thought, I think, is a, is a good point also worth emphasizing. Um, and so, you know, I do sometimes worry that we get so obsessed with optics. Oh, what does the person look like? Um, and that we, we, we've stopped actually remembering that ultimately these are businesses, these are governments. We want the best people. We want the most competent people. And thank God there are tons of competent people who are Black, who are Asian, who are you know women, et cetera. So we, we absolutely have widened the aperture in terms of, of drawing on that talent. And that's a good thing for society. But if you ask me, let's just take the, the case of corporations. What can they do better? There's an enormous opportunity here. It's not just about diversifying who you you know attract, uh, retain, and promote as you you know you 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 fill up uh, employees in your organizations. Um, we spend a lot of money um, with uh, legal firms, with accounting firms. We can have um, much more influence from the boardroom on subcontractors and who we are asking to help support the business. But beyond that, we are hosting events in different cities. Um, whether it's in Birmingham, we're hosting conferences in, in London, in, in other areas of Devon, um, et cetera. Why can we not say, wait a second, before we host um, our annual general meeting in town X, let's actually go and look at what they have been doing in these areas of education, of healthcare, criminal justice, employment. We, we can actually say if this town is not doing well and they've got a lot of racial injustice they've got a lot of gender concerns they have not been investing in education we don't have to go to those towns um, and and host events there we have the ability to be innovative and to reward cities and towns and municipalities for their great efforts when they do them and to essentially not provide support to institutions or places where they're taking a view that they're not interested in progress so i do i have a lot of faith that there are lots of degrees of freedom for organizations in the private sector, in the public sector, um, and even, even in, uh, in, in civil society more generally. Well, um, I think one more question that I'm curious to know is from, was from Vanessa and about the, the donor economics model and, and your thoughts on that. Does that offer any insights as to how we solve these complex problems? You know, there are so many models. It's not my space to talk about that. I'm not, it's not my area. I do know about the donut economics, but I think that the, some, you know, the people who are authors of that subject are probably um, much better placed 
um, to, to sort of make the pros and cons of, of that modeling. And look, there are lots of interesting new models. There's, in, in, there's a lot of interesting work on happiness indices. There is evolution happening. Um, it, it might not be at quite the pace that we would like, but um, I do think that, uh, and you know, obviously MMT has come back. There's, you know, for every one model, there's something else, uh, you know, that uh, that people are talking about. So I, I remain open-minded. I think ultimately, uh, I'm not really interested in labels, Keynesianism, donut economics, this and that, because I ultimately, I think it's just about pragmatism. <laughs> We're trying to move society forward. I love the notion of Pareto efficiency in economics, which is that we want to move everybody forward without losing anybody, uh, without making any one person worse. Um, and to me, that's a simple enough uh, goal, uh, if, if not hard to execute, but a simple enough goal. And uh, we sometimes complicate these things by not taking into consideration, consideration other people around the world. Lovely. And the final question is looking to the future, actually, and thinking about the next generation. It's from Jonathan Broadband, Broadberry, I beg your pardon, uh, about early intervention and long-termism. Jonathan. Hi, thank you. Yeah, very quickly, obviously, we represent uh, providers in the early years sector. And, and to your point about leadership from government and look at, you know, a lack of uh, short, uh, short termism, uh, we know there's economic benefits to investing in children early in their life, uh, both to fa working families and the educational outcomes for those children. But maybe what can uh, employers who would benefit uh, do uh, working in partnership go with government to really strongly make that case uh, for stronger investment at a time when obviously there's going to be a lot of demands on public spend um, as we recover from COVID? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, the bottom line is this, we are not going to succeed. We are not going to succeed at solving any of the challenges the world faces, nor are we going to succeed at continue to innovate for society if we're not educated. It's as simple as that. It's not more complicated than that. And of great distress to me, and I think many others who care about education and progress, it are the statistics that the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development puts out, the PISA statistics, Program of International Student Assessments, that comes out every few years. And they, they literally rank countries in terms of mathematics, science, reading. These are the key areas that we know are, are areas of STEM uh, that are going to be important for the sectors that are, are coming in the economy in the future. The bottom line is that we are underperforming. Developed countries are underperforming and it's really materially problematic. Corporations are trying very hard. Um, not obviously, this is another area where we've traditionally felt that public sector should take the lead on education. Um, and so this doesn't mean that companies don't have any role, but I do worry that we don't want to create tiered systems of classes where certain companies have specific um, company, uh, sort of uh, uh, education systems and are funneling their own employees through that. We're talking about broad-based education interventions. Companies are doing a lot of work in terms of providing scholarships, supporting specific programs to, to sort of train um, you know, uh, uh, um, people so that they can provide inputs to their own organizations. But that's a quite a narrow way in which companies can, can work. What we're looking for is broad-based intervention. And again, that means government has to be involved, notwithstanding, as you rightly pointed out, the trade-offs and the challenges of much more tight um, uh, balance sheets um, and, and uh, economic situations. Look, remain positive, remain constructive, but the bottom line is for me, if you have to have a marginal dollar to invest if you're government, you've got to put it into education. It's going to help solve the big problems longer term. Wonderful. Well, what a way to end. Um, we, are, we have covered a range of complex, sometimes despondent themes, but I think that note of optimism and, and really focusing on what we need to do uh, in order to achieve a Pareto efficient world, um, I think really sets us up um, for our work here at the CPP and um, as we try to play a part in that national and international dialogue around creating uh, COVID as a reset moment for a more a fairer and more sustainable capitalist um, society and system. So thank you so much, um, Dandisa. Um, really um, stunning to get your thoughts. And um, just a final thank you to all our um, questioners and our audience. And we look forward to seeing you in the autumn do sign up to our newsletter for more information on our upcoming events. And thank you again to Dr. Moyo. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. All the best. Be safe, everyone.